And isn't that the truth tonight? We can have many things in life that we say would make us happy. But you know, when we've got His presence, we've got everything because there's nothing like the presence of the Lord. And amen. It's lovely to see each and every one of you gathered this evening again. Everyone seems to be a bit earlier tonight coming in. And it's great to see there's still a few folks coming. But if you're visiting us, especially for the first time, I know there's people here from all over the world tonight. I've spoken to just a few, and I'm sure there's many, many more. Let me give you a warm welcome to the Metropolitan Tabernacle in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're very welcome indeed, and we're delighted that you've come to worship the Lord with us. We're going to worship some more just before we hand over to the pastor. We're going to sing that lovely worship song. There are no words to tell you how I love you. There are no words to even make a start. There are no words worthy of your sacrifice. There are no words, so Lord, I give my heart. Then everyone, let's worship him as we're in his lovely presence. Everyone, there are no words.
everybody. Delighted to see each and every one of you in this holiday Sunday. What a wonderful turnout again tonight as there was this morning and over these holiday Sundays. It's just been great. I want to sing an old golden oldie, 172. I mean you sing it uh, with me. 172. There is a green hill far away. Mm. Without a city wall Where the dear Lord was crucified Died to save us all Lovely old hymn Could we stand to our feet and sing it 172 Come on <laughs> There is a real
thank you father tonight for the privilege which is ours to be able to come into your presence and we will remind ourselves tonight how we can come into your presence it was through him who knew no sin who did no sin and yet he was made sin for us we thank you for him tonight. We worship him from the depths of our heart. We come in his name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, pleading the merits, the power, and the efficacy of his precious blood. We ask you, Lord, to shut every one of us in with yourself, this multitude that again has gathered into this great house tonight. We pray that the Spirit of the living God will move from seat to seat and from heart to heart, that Christ will be seen in all His beauty and in all His glory. We thank you for our visitors tonight who have come to minister to us. We pray, Father, that you will richly bless them and anoint them as they sing to us. And may many people be blessed in this house tonight. Thank you for the four souls that came to you this morning. Now we're looking again for the Holy Spirit to do His lovely and gracious work again tonight. That men and women shall come to know Thee, whom to know is life eternal. Our thoughts go to those that are in hospital, to those who are bereaved. That you will be with those that are bereaved and still tender after bereavement. Comfort them, strengthen them, and encourage them. And for those in hospital, be all that they need, touching them and reviving them again. Now, loving Lord, shut us in with thee. And we will be careful as always to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. just before you sit down, there are many people who come to us and they're lonely. You would know that. Just to make them feel at home. Just turn around and say hello. You never know who you're talking to. Turn around. <laughs> That'll do you. <laughs> you may be seated. <clears throat> the pastor... Erwin Ray is going to lead us in an offering hymn, and then I will introduce after that our guests, and we're delighted to have them. Dr. Paul Zato is his name? Zito, Dr. Paul Zito, where is he? He's running all over this place. Hello, Dr. Paul Zito. Let's welcome him. There he's up there. <laughs> He was out filming the cars coming in at the car park, and it was really wonderful. And so we'll hear, uh, they're going to sing three pieces, and then they'll sing a piece at the end, just after that finish. Is that okay with you? All right then, we might even hear our own choir, so we'll see. I know a lot of people like to hear the old tabernacle choir, so <laughs> keep all these things in mind. I think that's everybody's in. Say praise the Lord. Turn around and say to your neighbor, I'm glad to be here. I know you shook their hand, huh? <laughs> and listen, <laughs> I would rather be here than be in the best bed in the Royal. <laughs> remember years ago, you used to buy a bed in the Royal? So remember that. So we're delighted to see you. And the Lord richly bless you. Pastor Urban Ray is going to lead us now in an offering him. So give as the Lord enables you. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. Let's turn again to our hymn books, please. 
at 167. 167. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Everyone, as we worship the Lord Jesus then. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. everyone stand for the fourth and the fifth verse he took my sins and my sorrows then he took my sins and my sorrows And you may be seated, Pastor McConnell. <coughs> we are delighted tonight to have with us Dr. Paul Soto and his team. <laughs> what do you call yourselves? Witness. And you're from Los Angeles, from the United States. I want you tonight to give, come on up here, to give them a real white well welcome. <laughs> Lovely. To keep you in my 
to keep me close to you. Would die. 
for inviting us to be a part of your worship here today. We're in Northern Ireland all week long and we really enjoy being here and the people that we've met. And um, Our last song here is a traditional African-American spiritual and the name of it is I Know I've Been Changed and it is a song about how we know that when we meet the Lord Jesus Christ, He has changed each and every one of us. The old has passed away, behold the new. Um, we have now the new in us, and we are glad of that as the African-American slaves did way back when. We sing about the same thing. Sing 
me children I know I've been changed Yes, I And uh, just when I finish, would you sing two more? <laughs> Let's show them our appreciation. Thank you. <laughs> Would you please turn with me, please, to Second Kings chapter eight, the subject that we announced last Lord's Day. Second Kings chapter eight, beginning to read at verse 7 until <clears throat> verse 15. And Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God is come hither. And the king said unto Hazel, Take a present in thine hand, and go meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Hazel went to meet him, and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels burden, and came and stood before him and said, Thy son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, hath sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Elisha said unto him, Go say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover. Howbeit the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. And Hazel said, Why weepest, my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with a sword. And will dash their children and rip up their women with child. And Azel said, But what is thy servant a dog, that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord hath showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he departed from Elisha and came to his master who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, he told me that thou shouldest 
recover. And it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died. And Hazel reigned in his stead. And may the Lord tonight bless this very strange story indeed for his honor and glory. Would you stand with me for one minute, please? Holy Father, show us tonight the potential that is in every one of us. The potential to do good, the potential to do evil. Show us the two powers are assailing us, the power of God and the powers of darkness. May Christ be glorified in this service tonight. And may men and women come to him and will receive power to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Save precious souls and draw us closer to thy son. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> this is a strange, wild story. A story that happened in ancient history. But history, ladies and gentlemen, has a habit of repeating itself. And this story has been reenacted down through the centuries in the lives and the hearts of men and women like Hazel. It's strange because Almighty God is deeply involved in this story. And so are his purposes. Many years before this particular incident happened, a hairy old prophet by the name of Elijah had anointed this man Hazel with oil to be king of Syria. You see, the time had come for God to take the old prophet home. His ministry was now at a close. But before his home call, God commissioned the old prophet to do three things. One, to anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, to be prophet in his room or to be his successor. Two, to anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshai, to be king over Israel. And three, to anoint Hazel, to be king over Syria. Now the surprising thing was Elisha was now prophet, the spiritual advisor to the Israel nation. Jehu was now the king of Israel, but Hazel had not attained to the position in which he was intended. He was still a very successful soldier and commander-in-chief of all Ben-Hadad's fighting forces in Syria. But he was not king. You see, Ben-Hadad was still king. This had eaten into Hazael's heart like a canker, consuming him, possessing him, with overvolting ambition and pride to get on in life and to climb the stairway of complete power. And the person standing in his way was Ben-Hadad. However, Ben-Hadad took ill. So ill that Ben-Hadad thought it was mortally serious. So serious that he decided to send to Israel to Elisha the prophet to see if God would heal him and that he would recover. After all, didn't Naaman the Syrian come to Elisha to be treated of him, healed of his leprosy? And the man he sent was Hazel, his trusted counselor and commander-in-chief. Hazel had convinced himself Ben Haddad's time had come to go, and his time had come to reign. But it was not so. It was selfish, ambitious, willful thinking on Hazel's part. But it was not to be. The message of Elisha was, in verse 10, 
Go say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover, howbeit the Lord has showed me that he shall surely die. What did Elisha mean? I'll tell you. Elisha fixed his piercing eyes on the countenance of Hazel to the confusion of the soldier and burst into tears as he gazed into the dim, the dim and not remote future. When Hazel asked in surprise, Why weepest, my Lord? The man of God to a still greater amazement replied, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with a sword, and will dash in pieces their little ones, and rip up their women with child. Hazel embarrassed and astonished. His face red said, Am I such a dog to do this thing? But ladies and gentlemen, he did. He did. Now notice the accuracy of Elisha's words regarding Hazel and King Ben-Hadad. Go say unto him, Thou shalt surely recover. Now notice again, how be it, the Lord has showed me that thou shalt surely die. What did Elisha see? He saw by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is recorded in verse 15, Hazel smothering the king of Syria to death. And after that, his rise to the Syrian throne and his carnage and destruction of the Israel nation and his intense cruelty to the people. But here's the thought that I want to get over to this audience tonight. When the prophet Elisha wept before Hazel and told Hazel what he would do in the future, Hazel protested, But what is thy servant, a dog, that he should do this thing? He was rocked to his foundations to think that in him was powerful potential and destructive potential to do unspeakable evil. And the sad thing was, the pointed revelation of Elisha sparked to life the demon that was inside Hazel, and that demon took Hazel to hell. Friend, I wonder tonight what is inside us. 3,000 people are in the confines of this great house. I wonder what is inside us. I wonder what is inside you. If a man like Elisha the prophet, a man known in the scripture as a prophet, clothed with a double portion of the Spirit of God, if he stood in this pulpit tonight, what would he see? What would he see? And what would he say? What would he declare of some of you as you sit in this great house tonight? But there is a greater than Elisha in this house tonight. He is God's sinless son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is not just clothed with a double portion of God's spirit. In fact, the gospel of John declares the spirit of God was given without measure to him. In other words, the fullness and the almightiness of God was radiant and manifest in him. In fact, Colossians 2 and 9 declares, In him, that is the Lord Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He knows every man and every woman in this service tonight. He literally knows everything about you, sir. And everything about you, lady. And he knows the heaven that awaits some of you. And the hell that some of you may enter. Oh, I wonder. What potential is in this house tonight? The potential for goodness. The potential for blessing. The potential for the kingdom of God. The potential for evil. The potential for wickedness. The potential for the blackness of darkness forever. The prophet 
Hanani declared in Second Chronicles 16 and verse 9, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. What does those eyes see in this house tonight? What does those eyes see in the preacher that's talking to you tonight? What do those eyes see in the choir that sits behind me? What do those eyes see in the young singers that minister to us? What do those eyes see in this great audience tonight? The eyes of omniscience. The all-knowing eyes. The eyes of truth. Does he see hypocrisy? Does he see deceit? Does he see wickedness? Or does he see some man, some woman rising from the dunghill of their iniquity and darkness to trust his sinless son and to find cleansing and forgiveness and direction for the rest of their life? But did you notice when Elisha told Hazel the things he would do, Hazel convicted and shaken said, But what is thy servant a dog? That he should do this thing. He was admitting that an animal, a fierce animal, would only be capable of doing what Elisha said he would do. A dog, meaning one of those wild dogs that would attack and rend and worry and tear. Hazel was a dog. Hazel was a dog. And he described himself and he gave himself that name. But what is thy servant a dog? That he should do this thing. This reminds me of what John the Revelator in Revelation chapter 20 and 21, speaking of the great day of judgment and the reward of the righteous and the fate of the lost. He says concerning the holy city in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 14, listen to the words. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates of the city. For without or outside are dogs. The first thing that is outside the gates of the city are dogs. Mm. Note that tonight, ladies and gentlemen. That's what John the Revelator says. For without are dogs, the Hazels. And then he says, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whatsoever loveth and maketh a lie. Here is a catalog of evildoers, and the first on the list outside are dogs. Am I talking to a dog in this house tonight? Christ can change you into a new creature. Am I talking to a dog here tonight? Yes. Some man beautifully dressed. Some woman beautifully dressed. Respectable to the outward appearance. But inside, full of evil. Full of corruption. Full of sin. This was Hazel. And listen, he was a great fighter. He was a great soldier. But inside him was a cruelty. And a fierceness. And an anger. And an evil. That was like a wild dog. And Elisha saw it and told him that. Hazel, meanwhile, reported back to his master, Ben-Hadad. Verse 14 of our chapter says, So he departed from Elisha. Mm -hmm. Oh, if there's an Elisha in your life, never depart from him. Mm -hmm. If there's an Elisha in your life, lady, never depart from him. If her son Elisha in your life, young man, never depart from him. Because he's a man with a double portion of the spirit of the living God. Remember, he was a young man when Elijah was taken away from him. And Elijah said, what do you want before him taken away from you? He says, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And ladies and gentlemen tonight, if her son Elisha in your life, never seek to get away from him. I believe if Hazael had a stead with Elisha, he would have been saved. But we are told he departed from Elisha and came to his master who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? 
And they answered, He told me that thou shouldest recover. Now he told them half a lie. And he told them half a truth. He told me that thou shouldest recover. But the morrow came. The next day came. And on the morrow, Hazel became a murderer. Yes, the morrow came. He told me that you may recover. But the next day, Hazel became a murderer. Despite all his protestations of weakness and inability to do such things, he, the king's trusted servant, betrays his master's confidence and takes away his master's life. Taking a thick cloth, and dipping it in water as if to cool the fever of the king or to wipe his face when he was asleep. He spread the cloth upon his face and held it there so that the breathing stopped and the king died. Hazel suffocated his king. Is it any wonder that Jeremiah the prophet declared these words in Jeremiah 17 verses 9 and 10? The heart... The heart, your heart, my heart, the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is deceitful above all things. There's many things in life that are deceitful. But the prophet says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who knows their own heart tonight? What man here tonight knows himself? What woman here tonight knows himself? What young person knows himself? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then he answers, I, Jehovah, search the heart. I try the reins. The word for reins there is the Hebrew word for kidneys. And the kidneys to a Hebrew was the most emotional part of a man and a woman's life. That's where they felt everything. He says, I the Lord search the heart. I try the reins to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God saw Hazel's heart and exposed it to Hazel through the eyes of his anointed servant Elisha. And Hazel didn't like what was shown to him. So he said, do you think I'm a dog. Now when you call the man a dog in the East, it was a term of extreme contempt. But you see, my friend, Elisha didn't call Hazel a dog. Hazel called himself a dog. Mm. And he was. Mm. The dog was in Hazel's heart. Mm. Who in this house tonight knows his own spirit? Only God knows you, sir. Only God knows you, lady. And that's why you need the power and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. You may need many things, but you need Jesus. Jesus is the most important person that you need in your life. You're running here and you're running there and you're looking for happiness and you're looking for this and you're looking for that. Jesus Christ is the only one tonight who can fill that void. He is the only one who can change your heart and give you a new life. And He is the only one who can give you positive direction in your life, and that for all eternity. Friend, we're here in the field of stillness in this house. The heart can only be read in the sanctuary. And we're in the sanctuary tonight. Or in the presence of God. The heart can only be read in the sanctuary. You cannot read it through journalism or criticism or political comment which exclude the divine element to know what Hazel would do. It's only Elisha who can read him. And it's only in the sanctuary that we know what things really are. It's only in the presence of the living God that we really see men and women and their work. In Psalm 73, David was going through one of those difficult times in his life. There may be someone who is just like David, 
says he saw the wicked spread himself as a great bay tree. He saw the wicked and there was no bonds in their death. They seemed happy even though they were dying. He saw the wicked prospering on the right hand and on the left. And he saw himself struggling. Struggling as a child of God. Struggling to do right. Struggling to walk with God. Struggling to keep in touch with God. And he said, what's it all about? The wicked are better off. And then he said these words. Then I went into the sanctuary. Then I went into the sanctuary. Then understood. I, the end. It's only in the sanctuary, ladies and gentlemen. It's only in the presence of God. When you wait on God in your home, when you wait on God in that wee place that you've given to the Lord, I have a wee place that belongs to Him that I talk to Him in. Find a little place where you and Him meet. Call it a trysting place. Call it a lover's place. Call it where you love your God and where God loves you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's in that sanctuary that you will understand their end. When the pulpit becomes the very tower of God, a very fort of heaven, then the preacher will be able to say, as no other man can say, what the heart is and what the heart will do under circumstances yet to be revealed. Tell me, pastor. I'm listening to you, pastor. Tell me, pastor, this. Whence has the preacher this power? He has it, ladies and gentlemen, as a divine gift. Then, did God know the world before he sent his son to save it? Friend, it was because God knew the world that he loved it and pitied it. And Paul declared, whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that wonderful tonight? Whilst we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Christ did not catch us on the return, seeing that we were about to amend and gather ourselves up for a supreme effort of reformation. It was not then that Christ died for us, but while we were yet sinners and while we had no hope, He came and gave us hope. <laughs> Isn't He a wonderful Savior? I read in a book and I thought it was beautiful. The lady said to the man, you give hope like a man puts his hand in his pocket and throws out candy. <laughs> you throw them everywhere and you give hope. That's what Jesus does. He sticks his hand in his pocket and he throws out hope on the right hand and on the left. Isn't he a wonderful Savior? Isn't he a wonderful Savior? It was not then that Christ died for us. But whilst we were yet sinners, while both, while both of our hands were stretched out in rebellion and then thrown down to cruelty and then put out in oppressing and in wickedness and wrong of every kind. When the heart had gone astray, Christ had died for us. He's a wonderful Savior. I love what the old poet wrote. How helpless and hopeless we sinners had been if he never had loved us till washed from our sin. And then he says unto him who hath loved us and washed us from sin, unto him be the glory forever. Amen. What do you think of Jesus tonight? What do you think of Jesus tonight? Ladies and gentlemen, Christian brothers and sisters, what do you think of Jesus? Shut it out! <laughs> Sir, if you can see that there's hope for you. Lady, if you can see that there's mercy for you. If you can't see that, then there's only hell for you and separation forever from the presence of God. Then in God's name tonight, open your heart to the Spirit of God and God will send the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. When God through. When God read Hazel's heart through Elisha the prophet, Hazel didn't realize that this self-revelation of his heart was to show him his need of God's mercy and grace. There was mercy in that revelation. There was an element of kindness. And while he said he was a dog, God was saying, right, I can change you. 
There was an element of mercy. Hazel didn't realize that God's Holy Spirit was convicting him of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. So he spurned the correction, and he spurned the mercy that was offered to him. And so the slaughtered soldiers and the desolate homesteads of Israel were the sequel of the cloth on Ben-Hadadad's face. The prophecy of Elisha did not prevent Hazel from his sin. The clear sins that they were sins did not prevent him. The horror struck shudder of conscience did not prevent him. It was soon gagged. And Hazel went on to hell, the place of all unrepentant murderers and Christ rejectors. I feel tonight in this great service that I'm speaking to a man for the last time. I'm speaking to a woman for the last time. I'm speaking to a family for the last time. God, the Holy Ghost, is speaking to you and showing you your need of Christ and showing you your sin before Him. And you're going to go out here tonight and you're going to sin with importunity. And you're going to die without God and without Christ. And without hope in the world. And yet I feel there's someone else. And as you've heard this word tonight, the Spirit of God has laid hold on you. And you're crying already within your heart, Oh God, how do I get right with you? Oh God, how do I come to you? Oh God, will you help me and deliver me? And the God of deliverance is here tonight. Pastor McConnell, answer me one thing. What about the man who was murdered? What about him? Let me tell you something about King Ben-Hadad. It's wonderful how ready men are to forsake God when they are well and then seek his help when they are in sickness and trouble. When Ben-Hadad was well, the king of Syria bowed himself in the house of Remen, his God. That's right. He had an old wooden God called Remon. And he bowed himself in the house of Rimmon, his God. For some of you, and you have a God in your life, a God of lust, a God of evil, a God of wickedness, a God of ungodly pleasure, a God of vice, a God, a secret God. And yet, when you're in trouble, you will go to the living God and you will cry for mercy. Now, Ben Hadadad realized that. But there was a living God. Did not Elisha, the prophet, after he had healed Naaman, and remember what Naaman said to Elisha? He says, Sir, will you pray for me and pardon me? Because when I go back to Syria, I have to go into the house of Rimmon the God, and the king will lean in my hand, and he will worship that God. But I'm a new convert, and I love the Lord. Will you help me? And Elisha prayed for him. And encouraged him. As I said, when he was well, Ben Hadadad, the king of Syria, bowed himself in the house of Rimmon as God. But now, in the time of weakness and anxiety about his life, that old wooden god Rimmon is forgotten, and Ben Hadadad sends to inquire of the living God of Israel. Many of you here tonight have been guilty of the same selfishness and sin than Ben Hadadad was. While things were going well for you, the world's gods and the world's idols were the things you worshipped. But when things were not going well, it was then and only then that you turned to the true and living God, the maker of heaven and earth, the maker of hell and the maker of heaven. Did you hear me, ladies and gentlemen? The maker of heaven and earth and the maker of hell and of heaven. And he says to you, follow me, and I will make you. The maker of heaven and earth. The maker of hell and heaven. And he says, follow me, and I will make you. But now that things have got better for you, you're back. You're back with your old gods again. But where, friend, this book declares, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, 
that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Pastor, was Ben Haddad saved? I don't know. Frankly, I doubt it. But if you want me to be honest, Ben Haddad and Hazel will see each other in the same hell. Oh, may the Holy Ghost convict every man and woman of sin in the service tonight and lead you to Christ and change your life. May God bless this story to every heart. And everybody said, Isn't that an amazing story? It's not an amazing story. Now let's see God's amazing grace. Will you say amen? Will you bow with me in a word of prayer? Every head bowed tonight, every eye closed. I don't want anyone watching, only myself. Dickens, I want you to make sure that no one moves about, please. <laughs> this is the most important part of our service. <clears throat> I don't want anyone watching. While every head is bowed here tonight and every eye is closed. Is there a man in this house tonight? Is there a woman in this house? And I know the majority of people here are believers. But I'm testing this great servant. Is there a man in this house tonight? Is there a woman in this house? A young man, a young woman, a boy or girl who will say, Pastor McConnell, I have heard God's word tonight. And God the Holy Ghost has spoken to me. And I'm not right with God, but I want to be. I need Christ. And I need Him desperately. I need forgiveness of sin. If there's a man in this house tonight who will say, Pastor, pray for me. Would you quickly and quietly lift up your hand and take it down again. We will see it and pray for you. Thank you. There's a lady. Is there another one tonight? There's one right across there. Thank you. Is there another one tonight who will say, Pastor McConnell, will you pray for me? I need to get right with God. There's one right across there. I'm just waiting on you. We can feel the Spirit of God in this place tonight. Is there another one? Is there another one who will say, yes, Pastor, I need Christ. There's another lady, thank you. Wherever you may be, lift up that hand and we'll see it. We'll see it right now. Just lift it up. There's one right at the back. Thank you. I see it up on the top of the gallery. There's another one down there. Thank you. Is there another one? Just quickly and quietly, wherever you are, <clears throat> lift that hand up. The Spirit of God is here. There's another lady. Thank you. Where are you, friend, tonight? Where are you, friend, tonight? God is speaking. Many's that pastor. Seven people have responded. Is there another one here tonight? Wherever you may be, just lift up that hand. There's one right on the gallery there. Thank you. Is there another one? Where are you, friend? Just lift that hand and we'll see it. God is here to change your life. God is here to do a work in your life. You know the potential. And as I've said those things tonight, the things that I have said have sparked off things inside you that this man could say, am I a dog that I would do this thing? But he did it. And he turned into a dog. Oh, may men and women in this house tonight turn into children of God. Oh, may people be changed by the power of the living Christ. Is there another one? Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, right there. Is there another one? Quickly and quietly. We're waiting for you. I think that's ten. Is there another one? Is there another one tonight? Quickly, we're not prolonging this appeal. We're waiting for you. We're going to sing twice through just as I am without one plea. I want the choir to help me. I want everyone. And as we sing it, sir, as we sing it, lady, lift that hand. I know God's speaking to people. I know people have never heard maybe a message like this before. Names you don't hear much about spoken. Ben Haddad, Hazel. We've heard of Elisha, but Hazel, Ben, ben Haddad, all this sort of thing. The Bible's a wonderful book. We're waiting for you. 
Is there another one tonight who'll say, Pastor McConnell, pray for me. I need to get right with God. Just raise your hand. Thank you. I see your hand, sir. God bless you. What does God's people say? We're waiting. We're going to sing the first time, just as I am and as we sing it. Just lift up that hand and we'll see. We'll pray for you right now. Are you ready, everyone, then? Just I Is there another one tonight? But <coughs> Is there another one? Just raise your hand wherever you are. There's another one. God bless you right up in the gallery. Thank you, sir. Um, is there another one? Quickly. Oh, we're waiting on you. Can I see that hand? There's another lady. Thank you. Oh, um, where are you, for, friend? Is there another one? Any signs? Thirteen people have responded. What does God's people say? This is the final time we're singing it. Christians sing it. There's conviction in this meeting tonight. Men and women have heard a strange message. And you've been come, you've been brought here tonight to hear this strange message. This is the final time we're singing and I'm waiting on you, sir and lady, to lift up that hand. Some family, will a family come to Christ tonight and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right now, everyone singing. Just. Is there another one? This is the final call. This may be God's last opportunity given to you. Just lift up that hand. God bless those young people. God bless you. See your hands. It's lovely. Three young people raised their hands there. Is there another one? Um, God bless you, sir. God bless you. Take your hand and thank you. Is there another one tonight? This is the final time. Is there another one? The appeal is dying out. The Spirit of God is calling. I come. Just lift up that hand. Seventeen people. Is there one more tonight? I know God is speaking. Is there one more? I've got the clothes. Is that it then? Then I'm going to bow to the Holy Spirit and say, thank you. Seventeen people have responded. We give God the glory. But we're still in prayer. Is there a man here tonight? Is there a woman here tonight? You used to love the Lord. You used to serve Him. He was precious to you. You've wandered away. You've drifted. And you find yourself an evil like Hazel. Would you like to come back to the Lord tonight? Is there a backslider in this house tonight? I assure you there's nobody watching, only myself. Is there a backslider? If there is, would you raise your hand and say, Pastor McConnell, pray for me. I want to come back to the Lord. Is there one tonight? God bless you. God bless you. Is there another one tonight? Is there another one tonight? Just raise your hand. Backslider tonight. Is there another backslider? Before we call this meeting to a close. Where are you, sir? Where are you, lady? God is speaking to you. Outside our dogs. Oh, say, I will arise and go to my father. I'm asking for the final time. Is there a backslider? Is there another one? Then we say tonight, to God be the glory. Eighteen people have responded. 
Now, you, those 18 people, would you put your hands out like that? We'll all do the same, and we're going to pray this prayer. Are you ready? Every brother and sister, pray this prayer to encourage these dear people that raise their hands. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, I come to thee in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending him into the world. And thank you that he was willing to come to die for me, a guilty, hell-deserving sinner. Take me as I am tonight. Save me from my sins. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash me and cleanse me in the blood of the Lamb. From this night, let me serve thee. Give me strength to tell my family when I go home. And my friends at work tomorrow. And I have come to Christ. Keep me day by day. Lead me on with thyself. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You say praise the Lord. After the service tonight. When you turn to go out. There's a room called the Mickey room. It's a library. And in that room will be brother and sister Young and Pastor Shaw Higgins. You that raised your hand, would you go in and give them your name and address so that we can keep in touch with you and help you and encourage you. And you will receive some free literature that will help you and will strengthen you. May God bless you. We're delighted again to have witness. Come on. Let's welcome them. And don't be looking at the clock. It's only quarter past eight, and that clock's two minutes fast. <laughs> We're going to sing two pieces, then we'll pronounce the benediction. The Lord bless them. Surely 
delightful to know that we in America and you here are serving the same Lord Jesus Christ and we worship him together this evening. Our last song is a wonderful promise that our God is faithful and he has never failed us. Was lovely. Don't forget us. We won't forget you. Let's show them our appreciation once more. <laughs> Pray about next Sunday night. It's about a husband and a wife who talk together and agree to lie for the Holy Ghost. Pastor McConnell, how could a thing like that 
ever happened that a husband and a wife could agree to lie to the Holy Ghost. Come along and hear about it. It's a tremendous story. Bring friends with you. Let's fill the sanctuary and we'll see what God will do. Will you say praise the Lord? Will you stand with me please? Thank you. Could we sing, there is no one like the Lord. Then we'll pronounce the benediction and go up and get a cup of tea. The Lord bless you. Are you ready? Come on. There is no one. wrote that song but it was in the hit parade 3,000 years ago because Hannah wrote it too she said there is no one like the Lord <laughs> read that in 1st Samuel chapter 2 it's wonderful so he revised it and brought it into the 20th century say praise the Lord there is no one witness and our friends who have come with them the pastors here with them please go upstairs and enjoy a lovely supper into that special room our sisters will show it to you the lord bless you and everybody's body is welcome for a bit of supper the lord's good say praise the lord let's just commit ourselves to him father we thank you for these dear ones tonight that have put their trust in me who have raised their hands, acknowledging their need of a Savior. We pray tonight that you will give them repentance unto life. There are those who are struggling, we feel it. We ask you that the Spirit of the living God will continue to work in hearts, even in the night watches, and grant that we'll see more precious souls coming to thy feet. Take us now to our homes, 
and peace and safety. Give everyone journeying and traveling mercies, covering us with the precious blood, being all that we need. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide upon us until Jesus comes. Amen. God bless you.